Um, perfect. All right. Yeah. Hello, all. Um, so uh, my name is Neil Gampa. I, I do stuff all over the place, um, mostly in Fedora, but also in other places. Um, but as part of my, uh, my day job, I am a senior DevOps engineer who works on software delivery and release engineering stuff. And something that we've been looking at for, God knows, I think over a year, maybe two years now is, oh no, three years because uh, I met Mike at, uh, at DevConf in 2019 and we started talking about this back then. Yep. Uh, Mike DiPaolo. Yes, thanks. So, yes, hey, hello, Neil. Yeah. Hi. So like since 2019, at least we've been looking at this and we're gearing up to try to um, internally, we're gearing up at redoing our infrastructure around this. And as it turns out, the ecosystem of tools like this is really, really, really small. And the ones that are actively maintained and support both Debian and RPM stuff, uh, your it goes even, it gets even smaller. and the ones that support Debian and RPM stuff and support, you know, things like package and repo signatures, uh, now you're just at pulp. Uh, so um, there's a couple of others that that optionally support it with some hackery, but like in theory, pulp is the one that supports it just out of the box. So we've been looking at it to see how we can take our existing setup workflows and custom stuff and, and put that onto, onto pulp to support our users and, and our growing needs. Um, so earlier this week at PulpCon, we were talking about um, how the developer team doesn't really have an idea of a large workload that they could emulate and target for optimize, for developing Pulp out further. And I figured, well, mine is the largest I've ever seen, uh, so uh, or I've ever heard of. So I figured I might as well put this out here in like a more general form. like. To be clear, the, the one I described out here is not exactly how our internal setup is, but it's super close and the concepts are still there um, to, to give you an idea of where, where we want to go. And I, this is actually more describing how we want things to work too um, going forward um, rather than entirely everything in the present. But our internal setup is almost 20 terabytes of data. Um, and so it's uh, between all the mirrors and the and the product in team repos and stuff like that and third party vendor clone mirror things, um, it's almost 20 terabytes. So it's a very, very large setup from that perspective. Um, so before I keep going on, I want to just uh, describe a little bit of what I'm describe what I laid out here. So this large workload, um, has three uh, three major um, pieces to it. There are distro mirrors, there are third-party repo mirrors, and then there are product team repos. Um, and two of those are centrally managed. The, the Basically, the mirrors are all centrally managed. And the product team repos are actually jointly maintained by the central team, which is my team, and also managed by um, the uh the team that actually uses it for their product so if you see here i have this kind of written out um let's see if i can make it maybe if i zoom out a little bit then it'll all fit yeah there we go so that all fits on the screen um when you it, with the team repositories uh usually the, the idea is that there's a an rbac style um configuration that keeps it so Teams can look at existing content that's been auto-imported by automation, and then they can promote packages as they need. And if they are using a snapshot release mechanism like Compose's style, like if you're familiar with how Fedora or Red Hat Enterprise Linux do their Compose processes, they generate um, with Punji um, a snapshot repo that actually is all the content that they're going to release together. Um, and then they use that to ship it out. Uh, some teams internally have a similar concept um, for image so, so that they can have a consistent set of inputs for a particular snapshot build. Um, and so that kind of workflow uh, is something that we want to have. And 
with snapshot stuff, whether it's mirrors or team repos. We got to keep them for a long time because we got to make sure that the long tail is actually supported up until a point. Then we can start purging things so that we can clean up space. Um, so there's this is why I think early in the week I said like, yeah, multi tenant. I need multi tenant with dedupe because otherwise this becomes unmanageable because what is like 15 or 20 terabytes is now like 100 because everything is just copied over and over. Um, but um, hopefully it's kind of mostly self-explanatory here when it comes to like how the mirrors and, and team repositories are set up. Um, another aspect of this when it comes to content imports for mirrors, you know, I think that's pretty obvious. They're repositories and we're pulling in the content. Before we pull them, we verify them. And if they're verified, then they can be released. Um, for, for team repositories, where a lot of the content is actually coming from our internal build system, um, we need the packages to be signed by Pulp and then the repositories also to be signed by Pulp. Um, because that's how, because the, the build system can't sign anything. So it's a lot, well, it can, but the signatures are not intentionally trusted by production infrastructure. So there's a whole set of policy differences there. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I'm kind of scatterbrained about this. Sorry. Um, but, uh, and then the last bit about this is the, uh, workflow principles, which is essentially, I want to delineate, um, uh, what parts are self-service and what parts are centrally managed. And I want to have strong enforcement of these policies. So that, you know, if someone comes and says, hey, I need you to tell me, you know, what happened here on this day with this stuff or why did this happen? I can say, here you go, take a look. And 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 people are relatively assured that we didn't screw up or something. Or if who screwed up, we can we can find out and remediate accordingly. Um, I don't really have too much else other than to say all this stuff. And I kind of wanted to do this to open a conversation about where y'all see where you want Pulp to go to support this kind of thing. Sure. Uh, oh, good. There's a Q thing. So, uh, Grant, go for it. Sure. This is great. Uh, 20 terabytes is scary. Um, I'm really glad to hear your your prequel about you know, you did a search based on your requirements and the, the the result set is small and that pulp is giving you exactly what you need. I'm sure there are things that pulp doesn't give you. If you could pick one, what one thing that pulp doesn't do right now, does your setup, would your setup take advantage of if it existed? Um, the absolutely most critical thing would be an RBAC. I need solid at ACLs to control access and permissions for each function in the API or CLI. I absolutely need that. Mm -hmm. All the other stuff I think I could work around in some way, like spin up multiple pulp instances or do fancy things with like um, with API or CLI automations or do weird things with Jenkins or whatever. Like there's a ton of like, but but the RBAC part, I can't work past that. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, well, well, I appreciate that feedback. That makes sense to me. Um, the, I think, um, of course, I mean, there's details all the way down, but I believe our plans for RBAC um, will allow you to provide the um, authorization that I'm seeing in this document, which is one way to perfect and i see matthias um confirming this which is great because he's actually the lead um and i think that is good because um that will of allow you to not have to get into a proper multi-tenancy setup which is good because in your case the deduplication is really important um and that also makes sense yeah, to be clear, what I'm referring to multi-tenant is actually not multi-instance, right? I am talking about yep. um, repositories being managed by individual people. Um, yep. So that's what I refer to with multi-tenant. I understand that there's two types of multi-tenant here. One is effectively sub-instancing, and the other is 
you know, access granting, and I'm going for the access granting kind because I don't want sub instancing. Pulp as a service is super interesting to me from a like I want to like play around with things perspective, but for production, no, just no. Yeah, I, I agree. That's something we hear a lot from our users. Yeah. Uh, I think we touched this yesterday. Uh, the current plans don't uh, involve having our back for content directly. Just like, or more of the type of if you own a directory where content is in, then you have access to it. But for like, repositories, their versions, remotes, uh, distributions, and all this is just, there will be roles. Uh, so you can assign people to be owning them or just consuming them and stuff. That's the current design. Neil, is the... Yeah. How is the... That can really be handled in a nice and uh, tidy way that needs to be figured out. Yeah. yeah, and this is what I want to ask about: is do we need to figure that out? Like from your perspective, Neil, um, are you are you um, familiar with kind of the content concerns that we discussed yesterday? Um, I'm not. No problem. So um, the state of so we still need to add, for instance, oh, RPM will need to have, and Debian, et cetera, will need to have RBAC added to it. So if we take that as an assumption that that's done, what you would have is the ability to um, have some users authorized to perform certain actions, manage these repositories, not those, read, you know, uh, download content from these distributions, not those, create these new distributions, all that. Um, what it wouldn't, what it won't do is uh, provide isolation around content. And so, like, if you take a package like Nevra, um, you know, XWIN123, this is, I'm just making this up here, but some specific, it's just called package foo. Um, and whoever uploads package foo first, for example, and the binary data they provide, pulp, because it's a bit deduplicator, right? will think of that, that as package foo. And then along comes another, uh, you're syncing from another repository out there, and it also has package foo. Well, Pulp is already going to use the one it already has. And so this is a, a, a gap, um, in my opinion, of the isolation that Pulp is providing. And we do not have a plan for that. And I, one, want to make sure that that's clear, and two, ask if that's going to be an issue. So. I can't think of a reason why it might be an issue right now, but one thing that, well, actually, no, I can think of one, the salt repo. So salt is um, a bag of stupid because what they do is they, um, they actually have a repository that includes the salt RPM. Plus they build their own rebuilds with frozen nevras of all of their dependencies. And I believe the foreman also does it this way and a few others. And so that's where that might fall apart. So if that is the case, it might be, I might be forced to have three instances of pulp to do that, but I kind of don't want to, if I can avoid it. Cool. So um, this is helpful for me in terms of feedback, which is that um, uh, content isolation in a single system is still valuable, you know, to, to the extent that we have to weigh that value against the the cost of complexity to deliver that. So that's, I think, just plain old engineering work that we'll have to think about. But um, you, I think you very clearly set the stage that that's still important. Yeah, like uh, I can think e even from the Red Hat ecosystem, as in like Red Hat Enterprise Linux product ecosystem perspective, I know from my previous experience working with Red Hat layered products that this happens a lot that there are collisions. And so this is something that probably does actually need to be handled um, in some way. Make Like a simple way to do it is that the object that you import gets prefixed, like with, um, with wherever content source is actually originally being imported to or whoever did it or whatever, like probably the content source that's being imported into like the repo and I then go from there. I think the, 
Um, we haven't discussed this, so maybe I should just speak for my own opinion, but I think we should try to look at the SHA-256s. Oh, and yeah, that'll work, too. I forgot about that. Yeah, if, if we, they're identical checksums, then who cares? If they're identical and it's a strong checksum, exactly, yeah. So, Daniel, uh, I, um, Yeah, Brian, we, we do actually uh, include the checksum in the uniqueness constraint, so um, if you if you add a new... Um, There'll be separate pulp, pulp content. So even even if like they have the exact same Nevra, um, if the package is a different checksum, it'll be a different pulp package. That's really and, and, great and, news and, for Neil. That yeah, is the, fantastic news because then I don't have to think about that problem. <laughs> yeah, the file will still be deduplicated if it can be, um, but I guess if it's a different checksum, it can't be. Um, but but basically the reason the the reason we already deal with that is because you could have the same package that's signed with different keys and then you have different package checksums. So it's something we already had to about and deal with. The thing is, it's it's yeah. that's it's definitely solved for the RPM case, but it's that's a special case where we did it for the signing reason. The question is, are there other content types where we need to have the more general solution where we don't already have something? So um, that's the place that I think we need to look. Sorry. Yeah, I, I just looked. It is soft in the same way for Debian plugin. That was my next so question. Perfect. I would call these packages rebuilds for for the discussion here. And I think the the goal or the rule is you can have multiple rebuilds of the same package in pulp, but a single repository at a single version can only have one of them. That I'm fine with. Like that constraint, I'm totally okay with because that because everything gets really yeah. stupid when you have more than one of the same thing. Yeah, it comes along quite naturally because they would land on the same uh, relative path. Yes, and also um, the for example, the Yum DNF clients only think about Nevra, not checksums, and so it would be indeterministic about which binary content they would receive. Same goes for apt. Actually, apt is a little weird about it, but like yes. The, you can effectively assume the same constraint. OK, cool. So I think what I'm hearing here is that um, good news for Neil, and it's still a problem, but we have a little bit more runway. Yes, but, but still the question is for multi-tenancy here, how far or yeah, how, how much packages can you reach that you've never seen before inside Pulp? So if Alice. Uh, uploads a package into her repository. The question now is, can Bob use this package in his repositories? And I don't think we have really clear roles uh, or really clear rules there. Yeah, that's right. So this is the other this is the other concern, Neil, is not only just tracking them separately, but um, what, uh, if one user, Alice, uploads her stuff, um, and then uh, Eve wants to steal it, all Eve has to do is construct a falsified Nevra and tell Pulp to sync from it, and Eve will have our back rights to do that. Eve can construct this, that's fine. And Pulp is going to be like, oh, here's the Nevra. Um, but in the case of RPM, it's the checksum matters, right? So the checksums will be and different. The same so, goes for Deb as well. Yeah, so, but for these other content types, yeah. I think that's that's where the the concern of data yeah, the evil stealing thing is. Can happen in the other in with the other types. We're explicitly right now. We're only looking at RPM and Deb internally, um, and maybe Ansible later. Um, but uh, those. But like my my concern has been around the system content stuff because um, pretty much all the other ones that are out there, so like Artifactory, Aptly, uh, Nexus, uh, some of the others. They evolve from language package manager tools before being system ones. And so their assumptions are flipped. And one of the really silly things, for example, in Aptly, which is actually admittedly a system tool, but one of the silly things that happens in Aptly is if you upload something of the same Nevra again, it just silently replaces it without telling you. Um, and so you can like straight up replace a deb with another one, and the result may be broken. Um, and that is not okay. Um, so if with with pulp, what you're telling me is that since the checksum actually guarantees the database uniqueness constraint, 
if someone were to upload into the same repo, note, same repo with the same Nevra and a different checksum, that should fail. So this constraint. Um, so no. So what, what, what happens is it does, it does replace it. It kicks out the old one. Yeah, but I think in this case, and I agree with you, Daniel, but I think I thought the same thing. But in this case, what that user is doing is expressing an intent for replacement because they are providing the binary data to a repository that they're authorized to use. So right, and that's fine. And that, so that's why it's okay. Yeah, but the, the problem was with, with Aptly was that because it uses an underlying global data store with um, uh, and Nevra-based um, constraints for everything, rather than including the checksum, you can replace the content for everybody, which is not acceptable. Yeah, that should not be possible. Yeah. And that should not happen. That's bad. Right. Yeah. Um, cool. There... I'm sorry, Neil? Yeah, so like the, the other bit of this is like, so our current system is basically silly putty with aptly plus create repo C plus snapshots on the file system. Um, so, uh, I basically want to replace this with, um, using pulp to orchestrate it via API or CLI. The major non-repository input mechanism is Datto's internal open build service instance, which while it does produce repositories and stuff, and I could do the mirror sync style, I intentionally don't want to, cause I don't want to preserve the si signatures and I don't want to preserve the repositories. So I want those to be imported as bare artifacts that are then re-signed by Pulp. Um, and another thing that I couldn't find clear information on, I knew Pulp handles signatures. I know that much. But what I don't know is whether Pulp can do signing itself easily or if I need to write a helper or whatever, because the documentation is not very clear on that. Um, and it's something that I've gotten inconsistent answers from in the past when I've asked about it. So. Um, what be nice, and I don't know if I can expect this, is actually like direct integration with some kind of signing service or just plain GPG if you really want to, you know, go simple or whatever, so that I can say I can configure in pulp with a repository. Okay, this is going to use, uh, you know, this team repository uses this signature. Here's the public and private key imported. Do your signing thing, whatever. So I can go ahead. No, I was going to say, I hope someone can clarify the state of things for the RPM and Debian feature set. Well, I, I can tell you for RPM that uh, currently we're signing only a repository and not each um, RPM. But I know that we are working on the container plugin on the content signing service. So there will be a way to. I think there should be a way to add signing services for each, like for each content. Uh, and, uh, but signing service in pulp is like, you will need to provide certain script and it's uh, your business to do this um, integration. Yeah, and pulp will just uh, use it for um, every plugin. Just tell me what I need. You just give me clear instructions and ideally also an example of like what I'm supposed to plug in and how, and then I'll do it. And for Debian, I don't know, maybe Matthias know, knows yeah. more. I'm not sure. Um, for Debian, it's only signing the release file. So uh, that's fine. You know I know Debian that... is stupid when it comes to signing, so that's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's providing a valid uh, a validation for the whole repository with, with a single signature, I think that's fine. Because you already also know what should be there and not only verify what is there. Um, really, the only time that this is a problem that Debian packages aren't signed is when I have to deal with an, a vendor that just gives me a dev yeah. and says, put this in a repo. And I'm like, how am I supposed to verify you didn't screw with this? Uh, mm -hmm. and, or it wasn't screwed with on the wire and there is no way to do it. And like, whatever, I've accepted that this is a lesser capability in the Debian side. Um, as long as I can sign repositories on Debian, I'm at parity with what I've got now. Um, because a lot of tools do not support signing repos at all. And so 
that that really like uh, made the list super short. Um, um, yeah. So in the Debian plugin, there is there are two ways. One is that you can sync an upstream repository, including the signature, and mirror it in the same way with the original signature. And I believe this is important to be able to install a Debian client that just uh, when, when the installer only knows about the upstream key, which obviously means you cannot change the repository content in any way. Um, this is done by using the so-called verbatim publisher. There's no difference in syncing, so the sync will always fetch everything it can. And well, for your published or locally published repositories, you can uh, um, provide a signing service, which is a pulp facility, to the publisher, and it will call to the set script to generate both the in-release and the release.gpg file in so, order to be okay. compatible to most app clients. Yep, that should be fine generally. Um, the so we have a case where we import the Ubuntu um, release and updates repos into one. Um, how do, does that actually can that actually be handled with the verbatim thing, or do I need to just do it a different way? I assume I would have to do it differently because you have to do it differently because the content, the content is depends. basically being mangled. If, if you say you can take both. Uh, file system layouts, lay them over each other, and there are no conflicts, then you could mirror them, or then you could sync them without the mirror flag, and you would end up with a repository containing both overlay. Mm -hmm. But if, for example, the release file would land in the same place, then it's obviously not possible. Right. Yeah, Neil, um, what I was thinking was, I think it has to do, oh, like, we should reduce that question down to, well, who, does your client, who do your clients want to trust? If they want to trust right. um, the re-signed packages from Pulp, then you can compose them just like what Matthias is saying. But if you want to trust uh, the upstream um, Ubuntu or Debian uh, mothership public keys, then you will need to keep them unmodified. Sure. Actually, yeah. The other so, way around. Sorry. Yeah, you yeah, can. So, uh, you can mirror them in the both in the same directory, and with the verbatim publisher, it will publish every single file of both syncs wherever it was before, as long as there are no file system conflicts. Cool. That and makes I sense. That. Yeah, that may, I understand what you're saying. You can you. sync them both in the same direct uh, repository, or sync them in different repositories, and use the copy API endpoints to move everything into a third one and publish that with the locally signed release file. Yeah, I think I'm fine with so the the main reason I even care about doing this merged or whatever is because of the snapshotting part. Um if it's possible to say two mirrors that are being done and have them tied together to the same snapshot version, then I don't care about whether or not they're mangled together or if they're separate. Like but it sounds like for snapshotting purposes, they need to be one repo. And so they would have to be mangled together. So I'd have to import um, the packages of the main, of the base, and then the packages of the updates, and then regenerate all of the components and sections and stuff, um, which is going to be tricky and awful, but like is a doable thing. Um, the uh, For the RPM side, because packages and uh, are also signed, I actually think I'm fine with regenerating all the repo data because then I can sign the repo data with my key and make sure that the packages are verified with the upstream key. And so that way I can tell whether content has been mutated or not, or if it is pristine or whatever. Because yum repo files, you can set multiple GPG keys to be checked um, for, for content signatures. So if you look at, for example, the mock config for um, OpenSUSE Elite 15.3, um, the main base repo has four GPG keys to check. Uh, and that's why, because there's a bunch of RPMs from different sources signed by different keys, and then there's a repo signed by another key. 
So Neil, I'm fine. Neil, and, and Neil, and do you expect uh, pulp to verify our yes. signatures during sync? Yes. All right, because that's also not uh, the case at the moment. Yeah. So one thing that has so this is more of the supply chain attack things that have been going on. Like I have been asked to find a way to ensure that content being imported is verified before it is imported. And that has be, because, you know, we've done it accidentally to ourselves or we've slipstream packages and broken things. But like it is ver a very real possibility that you could wind up being uh, attacked by, you know, maybe an, an evil mirror or whatever. And, and, and bad things can happen from there. So um, I know it, uh, Matthias just said that the, the dev one actually verifies in release on sync, which is great. So for, for, or for the RPM plugin, it would be great to verify repo MD XML ASC if it exists um, and then verify, uh, or if it's meta link based, verify the meta link and then verify the signature of going down and verify the RPMs as they're being imported. Yeah, like Daniel pointed out, it's it's on our roadmap, um, but you know priorities. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, we're we're right now doing, um, planning to focus on implementation probably starting in Q one, for a pulp principle as well. And this will be in collaboration with. Uh, the team that maintains the Ansible Galaxy CLI, which will allow Pulp to perform um, signing and also verification when syncing, but also to then publish and expose those signatures in a way that the CLI can verify them at download time, runtime, and at some point in the future, uh, or install time, and at some point in the future, runtime. Yeah, and thank you for the post. It's it's really helpful to have it uh, there and written. Yeah. So like, it sounds like you're maybe eighty percent of the way there for supporting all all of my use my particular feature requirements, which is which is good. Um, I think it's it's really figuring out like what the timelines are for that for that remaining feature gap, and then maybe coordinating and figuring out how to on ramp for that as well because. Um, like I, I feel like Pulp is the closest to actually solving my problems and some of the things that like I just haven't been able to find solutions for, and like there are things I can obviously cobble stuff together. Like if if signing never actually became a thing, which would uh, signing verification was never a thing, which would really suck, and I think it will be. So fortunately, that's not going to be an issue. But if it wasn't going to be a thing, like the way I was going to cobble it for our existing setup was. I would fetch the metadata manually, check the signatures before I even passed it forward to be imported and stuff like that. But I don't want to have to do that with Pulp if Pulp can just do it itself because Pulp Deb apparently already does this. So it's just Pulp RPM that doesn't. But uh, yeah, so like at least from an existing ecosystem perspective, what I got, the fact that Pulp Deb already does this means that for most of my use cases, that's already dealt with. It's just uh, it's just making sure that the RPM content is also handled because of that. Um, actually, there is one last thing. Um, do you guys handle mirroring from HTTPS mirrors rather than requiring rsync? Because uh, rel UBI is, doesn't have an rsync module, so I haven't actually had an easy way to pull that down. Um, if, if you're talking about what I think you're talking about, the answer is, Yes, um, we don't like we don't look for an index of HTML or anything, but we um, we then load all the files that we. So we'll we'll make a request for dot tree info, which may or may not be there, and it sometimes is also just called tree info, and we'll make a request for you know repo md dot xml dot asc. So we're we're not like. I'm not sure if there's a way to sync to like search 
for these files, but we, we, we download the ones that we know might be there and we can mirror all of this. So you, it, at sync time, you can create a publication that contains you know, the original repo md.xml.asc and everything in the correct locations as it was originally. And um, uh, everything that was in extra, extra files.json. Um, uh, there's no, there's no like, um, yeah, there's no, uh, we're not sure of any way to like search, but um, we we make requests for everything we know might be there. So I just threw a link into the chat of the UBI8 repo, of the UBI8 um, URL from this, I, I kind of stole it from a repo file that pulling up the UBI8 container and looking at it. Um, I don't see any indication that they give you hints about what to fetch, which sounds like you should probably talk to the to the REL UBI team to add something to make it easier for you guys to sync it because uh, this is certainly something that I feel like because you're in the same company, this is something you could solve. <laughs> One would hope. One would very much hope, yes. But the reason why this why it, it actually came up as a thing was um, a while back, uh, Red Hat accidentally broke their their repos because uh, uh, their CDN was down um, entirely, uh, and that meant all of our containers stopped updating or working or whatever. And people asked me, "Hey, is there? Can we just have like a backup mirror of of the whole thing?" And it turns out, uh, no, it's not easy to have a backup mirror of the whole thing because there's no rsync module. There is uh, no easy scripts or setup for being able to repo sync the whole thing. So like, what do? So. Um, oh, so the whole thing, not an individual repo. Yeah, the whole uh, UBI uh, content set, which is all the, the, uh, all the repos for all of the architectures. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't have anything like that. Yep, that's what I found out. <laughs> I mean, from my perspective, I only care right now about x86-64 and maybe ARG-64 in the near future. But like, I think that since I'm bringing this up now and we're talking about it, it's like, maybe you should go like talk to the REL UBI people to to have a general solution to deal with this problem. Um, so that that actually can be handled by Pulp RPM to, to easily handle importing all the things. Because otherwise, I have no idea what you're supposed to do. I mean, I think the idea is make n repos. If, if I mean, the term pulp just does not have a notion of a content set. Sure. No, I'm using the word content set as a general generic term. I'm not saying this is a pulpy thing. I'm saying um, I just want an easy way to mirror the, the UBI repos so that when they go down, it's not a problem. I don't really care beyond that point. I just want an easy way to deal with this problem. Well, I think it's a potentially valid um, use case that uh, people want to have all the repositories synced under like certain URL. So uh, I think if they provide a listing file, we should be able to um, like proper translate listings. That. Proper yeah. listings, yeah. We should be able to translate it into like multiple things and multiple repositories. Um, yeah, and if you have a format for this, we should also just have the Fedora people add it and the OpenSUSE people add it to their repos and whatever. So that people can easily mirror distros um, directly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like, that would be very convenient. For that, or if you don't, figure it out and we could, and that's something we should have added to places. Certainly would make my job easier. Um, Neil, I was hoping to ask you one question, also point out one thing, um, if I may. It's a little bit unrelated to what we're talking about here. Um, so the thing I want to point out is that I see at the bottom of this post that there's a, um, it would be valuable to have some sort of UI, um, particularly for read um, use cases. And so uh, there is, um, I would describe it as experimental, but there is an effort underway right now to do that. Are you familiar with that work? Um, I know you guys were talking about it briefly last year at BulbCon, so I don't know what happened since then. 
Um, I'm not the best person to give the update in this area, but um, I see Grant is raising his hand. Grant? Sure. Uh, since Dennis is probably the best person and he's not here today, um, we are working in cooperation with UMass Lowell. Uh, they have a, um, we have basically five incredibly bright students who are working on uh, as a, their senior capstone project for the course of this year on building a, uh, a pulp UI. Basically, it's a, a Node.js. It sits external from pulp. It talks to the API, so it's not like it's going to know things inside. Um, and their first, the, their goal for this year, I mean, part of the project is the design and the mockups, and they're doing the whole software engineering thing. But their goal for this year is to get basic uh, support for uh, status tasks and RPM, being able to read repositories, repository versions, and understand content. Um, That's awesome. And it, it's awesome in, in all kinds of ways. I'm having a great time working with with uh, this gang because they're uh, some of them have already interned at places where they were doing uh, Node.js stuff, and they understand React, and they understand GitHub, and they've all managed to get Fedora VMs running on their incredibly underpowered laptops, and they've got one container up and are already talking to Pulp. Um, so I have high hopes for the course of this year seeing that happen. Um, there is a Pulp C, uh, Pulp uh, UI project under the Pulp, the aegis of the Pulp uh, GitHub, uh, which is basically the um, it was the the framework, the skeleton that was put together by last year's class. It didn't get very far because last year was COVID and universities were kind of a mess last year. So no uh, last year's last year's class had a lot of uh, problems that that were unique to last year. Um, I'm, it'll be interesting to see where we get this year, but that's happening actively. We meet with them once a week, uh, get reports from them. We're trying to encourage them to put stuff up on GitHub as they go, instead of waiting until the end of the year and then pushing the whole thing up at once. We'll see. I don't know how that works with the pedagogy that, that UML uses. Um, but anyway, that's, so there is work being done on that and we'll see how we go over the course of this year. Yeah, Sounds and exciting. Perfect. Uh, I'm also super excited about it. And what I wanted to, what I'm hoping for, I don't know if there's a post on um, on discourse about it or not, and maybe the repository is the best way to follow along. But anyways, yeah, um, some way for Neil for you to follow along would be ideal. Um, then the other thing I wanted to ask about, this is more of the questioning part that I had is, um, do you have some thoughts in terms of what you're planning for driving pulp um, in terms of, you know, client bindings, um, for Python or Ruby or something like that, or yeah. is it all CLI? And and if it's for CLI, have have we thought about if there are any gaps there that need to be filled? So today, right now, I have silly putty in the form of shell scripts and Perl scripts that shell out to the aptly command and a couple of others and stuff like that. I would like to replace this with proper instrumentation with Python. I would write, like from my team's perspective, Python-based automation is the easiest for us to work with. There, uh, like a, a couple of things might be, like a couple administrative actions might wind up just being CLI things because they're already gonna be things people just do rather than something you do in, in automation because you really don't want to automate deletion of content in a way that makes it like too easy. So that, that's the kind of thing where it's just like, I don't know what we're gonna do with that yet. But um, like if, if I wanted to say like what I would expect from a CLI or, or, or an API integration is I think from a CLI perspective, like kind of the types of actions and stuff that you could do with the aptly command is kind of where I'm, I'm aiming at. The aptly command line syntax is awful, please don't copy it. But like the, <laughs> Every time, every time I work with the Apple command, it's like, okay, how do I figure out what this is? Okay, this subcommand doesn't work the way that you're supposed to think it does. How do I do it with this way? The actions are inverted. It's like, okay, whatever. Don't copy the, the CLI interface of Apple. It's terrible. But think about conceptually what types of actions are available in the Apple command line. And that's kind of where I would like to see for, for, for a pulp CLI. Um, I haven't taken a look at what you've got right now for pulp CLI, so I don't know too much about uh, what to offer you in terms of gap analysis. Yeah, that, but, that's fine. Um, from an API perspective, the um, three major things 
that I expect to have through uh, basically Python API or automation stuff through language bindings are. Um, in our OBS, you can do post publish hooks. And one of those post publish hooks would be take all the RPMs or devs and whatever, and then shuffle them over to pulp via uh, and publishing them instead of publishing them there in addition to the local repo publishing for, for you know, developers to dev and test and whatever. Um, and that that's one thing. The second thing is um, API automation for creating snapshot versions um, of production repos that are used for composes and cherry picking packages to put into um, a repo. Um, I can't give you too much detail right now because I got to like clean up what I have to put into the discourse post, but I can like say one thing that we do is we have this giant pool of unstable, as we call it, or dev packages that have just been directly imported from our OBS. Mm -hmm. And then when our image build process starts, the first thing it does is take this um, TOML or INI or config parser style file, and it runs through this list of nevras and says, all these nevras need to exist in a repo tag named stable dash date stamp. And mm -hmm. that is an overlay repository on top of the snapshot mirror stuff. And that's how we do our composes for building our product images. Yeah. Um, so that stuff has to be, be able to be done through API automation. Um, the rest of it, like, I, I don't know. Like, yeah. those, are the, those are the main things that I can think of right now. Um, if I come up with more things or if I can get some more details cleaned up and put in there, I'll throw it into the discourse thread that I created and then we can kind of go from there. Cool. That all sounds great. Um, yeah, the API, the bindings that we produce are some people build them locally, um, but we also publish them through PyPy. I think for your cases, that's probably all you'll need. But um, yeah, uh, we build those in either case from the open API schema. So, oh, um, sweet. so, so then you can generate any bindings for any language that way. That, that's right. And we have documentation on how to do that. We do them for TypeScript, Ruby. We actually build and publish them for Python, Ruby, and TypeScript, but any of the ones that are supported yeah. by OpenAPI. The only other language there. I think that people might want is PHP because our Datto yeah, is actually a fine. Python and PHP shop. So, so we have so we have documentation on how to do that. And mm -hmm. we we had, you know, we documented it and then we actually did it for TypeScript and it worked out real well. So I think that'll that'll get go get you very far. Um, and sure. because it's it's automated from the open API schema, it's going to it, it's fully API feature complete. So if, you're, if your interest is API for all the deep stuff, you're in good shape from a gap Excellent. analysis perspective. And then check out, whenever you do check out the CLI, um, I think you'll love it as much as I do. And I'm always impressed at the litany of commands that are already available. So um, in the event that you want to use that for some administrative stuff for everything you've yeah. described here, I think that's going to work out just fine. I think when we finally get around to starting to set up our POC deployment of Pulp to start like testing out workflows and stuff and adapting our automation principles of, of tasks that we want to provide. I think that will let me give you more concrete feedback about these sorts of things. Because right now, technically, I haven't had time to start on our proof of concept deployment to like really beat into this. But um, I just wanted to give you guys some heads up and like thinking about like what what we are looking at, so that you guys aren't totally surprised by you know any gaps that I might find. Yeah, and I hopefully. think this is wonderful. And like, oh, honestly, hopefully, I think what you guys can do with this is you can take this and build a pulp deployment that you can, you know, serve and have developers look at and poke at to optimize how you're thinking about, you know, serve handling these kinds of things. Because nothing I just gave you is any particular secret thing. I even gave you examples of public types of content to pull in to like replicate my setup. Uh, so like. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is excellent. I mean, I'm really appreciate you doing this with the transparency that you are um, and putting this onto the discourse and using that tooling. I, I think it's really great. I think your success is our success. So this is going to work out well. That's awesome. Um, I think maybe that takes us to the end of our hour, Melanie. Does that sound right? It sounds right, Brian. I will just hit the um the stop recording button thank you so much neil uh, this has been great yeah